it, it sort of tells the story of what attracted to me to graffiti. It was the uh, characters that were borrowed from popular culture that really spoke to me. This is a uh, whole car top to bottom. Not a lot of people do whole cars, whereas you kind of swam through these things effortlessly. This is car number five of the whole train. This is one of the 10 cars that we had painted uh, prior to 77. I had pre-planned that train, that whole train, for a, uh, since 1975. And when we finally got the, you know, got our chances, our hands on, and on the opportunity to do it, I was like, I want that car to be in the middle of the train so that it could be, it won't be the opening act, but it'll be the, the middle act to something that's just gonna blow everyone away. This is We Have Arrived, the Fabulous Five, on the Five train. Hi, my name is David Villarente, and I'm sitting here with Lee Cunones, uh, also known as Lee of the Fabulous Five, a uh, graffiti icon, a childhood hero of mine. I often say oh, Muhammad Ali is the Wiz and Lee, is my childhood inspirations growing up. So it's an absolute honor to sit here with you today. Thank you. Wow. Good company. Gee. <laughs> so um, we're going to review some of these images from uh, Stations of the Elevated. Mm -hmm. I've been familiar with this film since the uh, early 80s. And not until recently did I have an opportunity to actually scrutinize these images by looking at the uh, digitally remastered copies and pausing the film to actually digest what I was looking at that was zipping past me. Manny happened to, by serendipity, be in the right spot at the right time for the right reasons to document all this, which a lot of people never took note to do, including the painters themselves, right? And it's great to see the work actually in motion because the argument has always been that there's something lost when it's taken off the subways, which is true. The actual movement of the trains made those trains rock and roll, you know, like literally, you know, there was soul to them. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing that you in the early 80s was aware of the film because not many people even, they weren't aware of the film, the existence of the film at all. We were uh, starving as graffiti artists. Yeah. Uh, for films that celebrated or documented the culture. There were very few. Yeah. But Manny captured some timeless material mm. and classic stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm going to start with this image right here. So this gentleman is Shadow. He's from a writing crew. Soul Stone Brothers. Right. And uh, Shadow's from Brooklyn, and he was a fixture in my Fort Greene community growing mm. up, and even until most recently. Unfortunately, Chris passed away 2013, mm -hmm. but he was also Spike Lee's little brother, correct? Yeah, he was. And I met, I, I had an opportunity to meet Shadow through a friend of mine that at that time in the 70s, late 70s, I was hanging out with him. His name was Deal. So we would go over to Brooklyn, right across the river from my neighborhood in the Lower East Side here. We all loved mini bikes and we'd ride across the Brooklyn Bridge and that's where I got to meet Shadow. The film opens up to the Shadow piece, which right. is pretty amazing. So he's yeah. forever immortalized. This is an independent slug whole car. Okay. Dirty Slug, as he's known, is an epic writer. He's one of the most, I would say, conceptual abstract painters I had ever seen at that time, until this time. He was more involved with, I would say, geometric shapes and coloring even before Futura was. He was interested in the shape of the car and what it would do when it would run into a station. So he's a really smart painter. Um, and just to touch back on the uh, whole train, so in almost 20 years worth of subway graffiti, it's a feat that has only been accomplished f on four occasions. Kudos to you for being yeah. the uh, first to do this and one of the few to do this. It was always great to watch one of those celebrations, as I call them, right, come through and kind of break open, you know, just disrupt the status quo and, and, and you never forget it. You never forget a whole car. But a whole train coming in was a mind fuck. You know, it was like, whoa. And the fact that maybe this is more than what people perceive it to be. It is art, you know, in the making. Even writers, you know, I remember their faces. They were awestruck by it. It just upped the ante to the point where it was like, we have to bring up our game. I think that, uh, Trains during your generation have typically uh, been inspired by the, uh, by the era. The 70s generation saw something they didn't like and they were inclined to protest and speak up about it. And there were a ton of political messages and concerns expressed on the sides of trains. And the later generation 
sort of, you know, my generation, the 80s, was more of a me generation. The rebellion, for good reason, of the 70s, post-Vietnam, women's rights, race relations in this country, and that anger spilled over to what you saw on the trains in the 70s and the 80s was the star me generation as you, you know, like making claim of your, of your ground, addressing yourself in a city that was so loud, too loud to even acknowledge your existence. So every culture creates the art it deserves. You could almost see it from the late 60s through the early 70s, a certain type of temperament, temperature in people and through the 70s and the golden age, as you know, many, some people have called it, of graffiti and into the 80s and in the 90s, you know, how it all changed according to what was going on in the climate, the political climate, the social climate, the moral climate of that time. So New York City was still, uh, even when I was writing, a relatively segregated city, in spite of it being the 80s. Mm. And I think that what the beauty of graffiti was that it, it had this, uh, it's a very unique New York pastime in a sense that it brought together people unlike any New York pastime. And it really wasn't about economic status or, you know, your religious faith or your uh, ethnic background. Mm. And quite often I would see a group of guys and I'm like, there's a Latino and an Asian gentleman and African American and, mm. and a Jewish fellow and mm. they've got to be graffiti writers. I've gotten chased by kids of color going to the three yard. Literally chased warrior style, the Warriors movie, like jumping over the turnstiles with dudes in hot pursuit. And the minute we went into the tracks, like, yo, you guys writers? Yeah, we write. Oh, you guys are all good. Don't worry about it. And turn, it's like all colors were joining in on the same conversation. We were all having a slow dance on a greasy floor, as I say. And that's what New York is about. That by coincidence, we all fall into each other's face and like, oh, you do that too? Oh, you're... And, it, and, and you don't get that anywhere else, and that's what I love about the city, and I loved about that move, this movement, is that many artists were able to discover themselves, not only for themselves, but they were also to discover that there were a lot of conversations coming in from different experiences, and it was great, because and then you can paint about it, and, and, and then the next day see the results, say, yo, that shit is fly. Or oh, that, that came out hurt, you know. You only had that one chance to do it, right? I don't think yep. people realize how fragile subway graffiti is. You spend your time sneaking into a train yard or a layup, and then you map out what you want to paint, and you risk your life standing on this uh, wooden plank just above a live third rail with 600 volts of electricity. Mm, I felt there, that. There, there, there isn't uh, <laughs> always sufficient room to step back and get a good perspective of what you're painting, and obviously you're in a dark tunnel or it's done under the cloak of the night sky, mm. so there isn't sufficient lighting. You produce these amazing works of art that you put your heart and soul into and get very excited about, and once you leave it, it's sort of at the mercy of whoever gets next to that train next. And some of these great pieces ran seemingly forever, and some of these things really didn't get a chance to even pull out of the tunnel sometimes. It was, it, it was that on two fronts. It was that on the municipalities of buffing it off, painting it off, or whatever, or someone else painting over it. So your work, yeah, wasn't guaranteed to run. And any whole car that I had ever done, I was very conscious of what I was going over. I had to be the point man and go into that layup, walk through that train and say, we're going to paint over everybody on this side of this train whoever they are, because it was the only opportunity at that time to do it. And I was like, I'm not turning back. I would have gone over any of my old whole cars if they were sitting there. But to go over a classic Blade or a classic Butch 2 or K's, you know, you almost have to almost leave it. Or if you go over it, you have to live with that guilt. Going back to what you were saying of painting stuff in the dark and all that, I felt from my practice was that I had pretty much everything mapped out in my mind I just went and traced over the lines, you know, uh, that were there already. Dark or not, I knew that train was 50 feet long, 8 feet high. Now at my age, I'm like, did I really do that? Like, it seems almost like a dream at this point, and wow, I really pulled that off. Um, one of the more prominent whole cards that appears in Manny's film is the uh, Heaven is Life, Earth is Hell car. You recently had a show on the Lower East Side where you showed off some of your original drawings from the early 70s, mm -hmm, some which were the inspiration for some of these whole cars. These are very powerful statements. Could you just share a little bit insight as to what the uh, inspiration was for this? Basically, my sarcastic humor on the questions of organized religion, the questions of organized thinking, 
you know, I heard one thing in school and by scholars of my community, and I saw and felt and experienced others on the street. So I was like, there's two worlds here at odds with each other. You know, there's the truth, you know, there's her story, his story, and the truth. And in between there, that's where I like to loiter. I like to loiter in the truth. And the truth is the irony of things. At that time, people thought I was religiously religious, and I wasn't. I was actually... That's what I walked away with at the time, the first time I saw it, was I thought it was a faith-based type of a Yeah, it message. was. It was. It was to many people, and great, because it served the purpose of both both path, both seesaw ends, you know. My way of, of 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 just opening up that conversation, you know, I I wanted to draw more on the original drawing, all the background, and you know, I didn't have enough space aside from not having enough time, and I was solo. You know, a lot of my cars were done on their own. I did many with the Fab Five, but I did many by myself. You you got to remember, two whole cars by one individual sends a message quickly to the authorities, like, you guys have no control over this 18-year-old kid. What is wrong with this picture? I was like, great. For that reason, that particular year, 77 and 1978, I was the most wanted graffiti artist in the MTA. Top of the list. They showed me the list. Like, Lee, you made the cut. Within a few months of each other, you know, this is happening, and they're like, this guy is totally out of control, or in control, I would say. And I had to divert to the BMTs so that I could throw the scent off. And then the cops would be on the BMTs and I'd jump back on the IRT. So it was a mouse, cat, and mouse game for quite a few years. I knew in my gut that I could possibly outwit, outrun, outplan, outdivert these guys, but I could not prevent a disturbance in the middle of a whole car, which to me was detrimental. It was a failure on stage. There's no explanation, there's no, there's no like, I got chased, like some cars, my paint dried up, my paint froze up, hot layup, shit like that, that you would see, like that was kind of comical, like what? You had the time to actually say I'm getting chased? <laughs> How's that <laughs> happening? You know, I'm like, yo, and like all of a sudden there's a dead drop, and there's like, what's the explanation? It's like dead air in a radio, like how do you explain that? And that's the reason why I went a lot solo. I was like, solo, I'm invincible, totally invincible. And with my peers, which I love to this day, it was rather interesting, <laughs> to say the least. And it was fun, and it felt good. They flanked me as my brothers. They still are. I love them all, to, you know, even though I don't see much of them. I'm a busy man. I'm a busy man continuing this in a whole different new larger yard now. I'm navigating more shark waters now than I ever did at 16, 17, 21 years old. I'm more afraid now as an artist to make my statement in history than I was then. Because I knew I was writing history then. This was history already being done without the reference to history as I say. You know, we didn't copy anyone other than our environment, our circumstance at the time. You know what I'm saying? So that was then. This is now trying to make a global statement within a global movement that for the first time when you think about it, this is probably the first and only art global movement by youth for all masses of people. That, of was, a, that was one of the things I wanted to touch on. Um, prior to, the, well there are two things I wanted to touch on based on what you said, but one of the things is that this is a creative renaissance unlike uh, none seen before it, you know. It's sort of Lord of the Flies, right? We have these kids that aren't old enough to drink or drive or legally vote or to some degree have any input on society. And this was a movement spearheaded by children. It brought kids together from every walk of life. And when you stop to think about it, it's just something that really boggles my mind that children, that kids spearheaded this creative renaissance and movement and it was allowed to last for as long as it had. And you also touched on something which I didn't realize, that the heaven is life, uh, earth is hell car. We're a married couple. A married couple are two cars that typically share the same motor, and uh, so they're permanently attached. Mm -hmm. And then um, you can usually tell it's a married couple because the numerical placards at the top are right. sequential. Right. So um, you have another married car here, which is mm. the uh, Lee Hell Never Dies. Very, very early car. 
I might have seen an early version of an all jive piece. An AJ-161 all jive. And I knew that it was one dude. I was like, why he put his name on the other? When it, you know, it gets separated like all, and then jive is gonna be on the other side of town on another line. And then I think I might have been that car uh, um, that I might have noticed like, oh, wait a minute, you know, the, the numbers are sequential and there's a solid beam in the as a coupler. It's not, there's no coupler, you know, hydraulic lines, disconnect lines. This, this is freaking, this, these are married. Nice. <laughs> Bigger palette, right? So I was like, oh, yeah, this is great. Double whole cars, boom. And I think that might have been led to like, Double whole cars, I can do 10 cars, you know, so it just, it just opens your mind to many things. Going back to what you had said, what mind boggled many and what mind boggles people to this day, the trains are the blood, you have to understand, it's the blood of the city. It is that worm that goes through the city and is tethered in any which way possible to many neighborhoods, many demographics. And the thing that we all discovered as young people that we cannot only change the face, literal face of a municipal item like this, a subway car, we can face forward our circumstance and actually discover a way of working ourselves around those circumstances, you know? So the fact that we are able to discover ourselves and say, we're in a fucked up situation, but we're underground on the same plateau, on the same level here, and we're painting about something that we need to, not necessarily we want, but we need to do this and then in the essence discovered an art movement. How fucking great is that? <laughs> that is, that is, that's mind boggling, you know? So we're gonna revisit the uh, heaven is life for two seconds because not until I had an opportunity to freeze the frames did I realize that the uh, earth is hell is mm. to the right, mm -hmm. the heaven is life is to the left, Right. and then we have this remarkable married couple series or two cars just beyond you. J139, Tracy 168, uh -huh. Kindu, Tad. It says 1776 to 1976. So I'd right. imagine that this is a bicentennial inspired car. Right. On the uh, upper right hand corner, we have the American flag as we know it. Right. We have an American eagle in right. the center of the car. Uh -huh. And on the far left, we have uh, Betsy Ross's rendition of the uh, Revolutionary War flag. Um, and just beyond that car, there's a uh, caricature of uh, Archibald Willard's Spirit of 76. And there's a very crudely painted America piece to the far left. It almost seems as if they lost steam. I think it's an amazing testimony to just how painted the trains were. You have essentially four cars running back to back to back that are fully painted. Yeah, that was like 1976. The INDs had their bicentennial ding-dongs. They had done a series of stars going across those that blue line. I remember that year, along with this time, that there was a lot of the bicentennial. So you referred to the car as a ding-dong, and for those of us, uh, for the viewers that don't know what a ding-dong is, um, ding-dongs were the uh, trains that made the ding-dong noise as the door shut. So we referred to those cars as the ding-dongs. Yeah. Um, I pulled this yeah. aside just because it really reminded me of my youth in so many ways. Mm -hmm. In 1969, Proked's released a uh, sneaker, I believe it was called the Superked, and it was also affectionately known as the 69er. While I was growing up, this is mm -hmm. what we wore, and these were the hot sneakers back then. Right. Um, the girl has on a... Uh, Jellies? Right, the jellies, yep. And uh, they all have matching tube socks on. Yeah, there was a lot of racking up of socks, tube socks back then. This instigated people to look at your strut. Sure. On the street, so if you had that strut, that swagger, you know, kind of look and whatnot. And, and which is interesting, because this gentleman here has a rather sophisticated uh, interlocking lacing system going on. And, and you know, dare I say, this could very well be the humble beginnings of sneaker culture as we know it. Is just trying to find the fly way to make your sneakers stand out and look good amongst other people. Quite contrary to that, in the late 60s, very, very early 70s, I remember running the streets, not having style was the style. And the first thing you did when you came out of a store was like, Stepsies, what? Stepsies, step on my shit, step on my sneakers. And the intent was make your sneakers grungy and dirty enough to show that you've been in the trenches. If they were too clean, you might as well be wearing skippies and you might as well be holding your mother's hand down the street. But if they were scruffed up and dirty, yo, that kid is down. He's like, 
He's jumping rooftops. He's hitching on the back of buses. He's writing graffiti. Um, I enjoy this image a lot, but we as graffiti writers meet somewhere and we bench. The uh, more familiar, popular bench is the uh, bench at the Grand Concourse. Right, of course. Every borough had its version of its bench or its own bench. Mm -hmm. And, and it's a practice where we just kind of sit down and we watch moving trains and essentially we're trying to digest, you know, the new works that have been created that week or that weekend. Right. You know, who were friends with who, by who painted together. And right. you knew who was no longer friends with each other right. when they weren't painting together. Right. Or maybe they started going over each other. Right. And right. this is where we gathered and, you know, there was this process. You come in as an apprentice, you typically have a mentor, so there are these trade secrets that you're not entitled to until you prove yourself. So I learned my way around a train tunnel at the age 14, mm. and I learned from a 15-year-old that learned from a 15-year-old the year before me. Right, right. And I think it's remarkable how just uh, resourceful we were. And uh, for a kid growing up in an urban environment, Bored, restless kid. This was really such an adventure. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I see the bench now as a sanctuary for most heads to go and influence each other, um, meet your heroes. Uh, it was a great place to utilize for many things to be able to survive in that environment. And also to show your face. You know, like when I met the Fab Five for the very first time at Brooklyn Bridge, the bench that I instigated uh, then, the three main guys, you know, Dirty Slug, Mono, and Doc, were all gang members. Black Spades, Savage Skulls, and Puerto Rican Brothers, and a combination of uh, sa um, uh, Savage Nomads. So these guys were, you know, wearing colors. And they're looking down at me literally like, you're Lee? And, and then they're looking at a whole car that just happens to pull up. I remember, I was like, yeah, that's one of my cars. I just did that last night. I'm here to take pictures of it, excuse me. Click. And they're like, you, how can you, you know, how, how is it that you're like this, you know, how'd you do that? I was like, I did the Spider-Man move, B. I don't need ladders. I'm climbing across that car like a, like a freaking, you know, a spider. And they were totally amazed at that. And I met them at a bench. We have one of your uh, Fab Five brothers over here. We have Slave. Kenny. And uh, Mopar's rule, Kenny. And, 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 <laughs> and he's up next to Peso 131. He, he's an old cat. He goes back. So, yeah, Slave. I mean, this, you know, I, I wouldn't say he's unsung because people to this day say Slave was nasty uh, to the core with his styles, you know. He's still painting to this day, and there are very few um, artists from his generation, um, no knock to anybody, that can yeah. still produce at such a high level. And this <laughs> car uh, always fascinated me, and it says born again, and there appears to be a gentleman stepping out of an egg, is that correct? Yep. What was the inspiration for this right here? And that was inspired by Tracy and Peanut and King too, as well as Jungle. Jungle from the TFP guys, right? At that point, at this car juncture, I was like, this is me saying that I am coming out of my shell and doing whole cars from here to eternity. And it was actually a battle versus Sec 2, which was from my neighborhood. Okay, he's an early writer that had amazing style, an amazing tag. His tag was so beautiful. He was a very proud cat. And he was talking mad lip, like, Lee, I'll burn you off the planet, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, oh, really? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm, bring, I'm getting my boys and we're gonna, pull, we're gonna pull out a whole car. I was like, get all your boys. I'm going by myself and I'm gonna do my own whole car. And this was it. Came out the next day, I burnt all three of them off the map. I uh, pulled the stem piece here. That's a classic stem. From what I gather, he was one of the early casualties of graffiti. Yeah. And uh, I would like to say that in spite of all of the dangers that existed, and I hear people constantly reference how many people have died for the culture, thankfully, not many have died doing it. So he was one of the few people that uh, suffered a uh, tragic death early yeah. on. 15 years old. I do think that it's remarkable that his work is immortalized in the film and yes. that we're still talking about him till this day. Going back to our thing about different, an Asian kid from Chinatown, from my neighborhood, AFX2, that bombed. He was all over on the F's I'm, I'm familiar, sure. He wrote with Stem and Cliff, black kids from East Harlem and uh, East New York. Where do you get that? <laughs> it's through the power of graffiti. Amazing. And uh, yeah. here's one of your illustrations from your show. Your uh, 
early fascination with muscle cars and uh, so hot rods, and, mm -hmm. and I know you're an aficionado till this day, and it shows in your early works. It, it stems back, and to this day, my love for Detroit, Detroit muscle cars, you know, cars that came from an era that I identify with, not only because I was a child growing up at that time, but an era that reflected a very rem a rebellious youth. Same as the youth that, you know, many things that reflect graffiti writers. This is a very early whole car, also done solo, that I had done with an old 1930s, you know, 1920s uh, Model T, Model B, with gangsters, uh, you know, shooting, filling my, my name full of holes, you know. It was a whole car I did on my own in the Bronx, and uh, I remember running out of fat caps doing that car, and I had to go back home and get fat caps and come back and finish it, all in one night. This whole car here was done by Doc 109. This is 77, 78 that he had done this, his fascination with cars as well. And now, you know, I, I mean, you know, my pastime is to sculpt and build a car, one car that I've been building, and, and it's a muscle car from the 60s. And, and I drive that thing, and it's like driving one of my whole cars from the trains because everybody was looking at it and saying, how'd you do that? Where did that come from? Where'd you get this? You know, there's so much um, dialogue that happens because of that that I love through the arts. The arts create dialogue. It, cre it creates a, a purpose, uh, an existence. Um, the reason for being alive is art. So during the era that Manny filmed uh, Stations of the Elevated, mm -hmm. New York was obviously a very different city. Yeah. It was a city on the verge of bankruptcy, um, graffiti trains everywhere, quality of life offenses everywhere, mm. and we flash forward uh, to today. Trains are completely spotless, and uh, where there was once graffiti, now there are full train target ads and vitamin water ads. Mm. Um, how do you feel about this, and what does that say about the city today? When you're in the subway system, obviously you're using a system, uh, a municipal transportation system to get you from point A to point B, but now that system has systematically made it open season to bombard you with everything about an ad for an item or a way of feeling. You know, do I want to see whole cars showing me vitamin water? No, I don't want to see whole cars showing me vitamin water. Maybe I want to see whole cars that are done by a youth initiative, a program that may be, be involving uh, young people that have issues that they want to address and maybe, um, and, and maybe have it like that. And maybe nothing at all, because you know what? What, is, what has happened on the trains, what happened in the trains 40 years ago now, um, did its course, and that's it. It's done. I'm, I'm at peace with that. Now, where does uh, one find graffiti in 2015? Where does it exist today? Graffiti, to me, has always been a state of mind. It's never even been anything that's tangible or anything. It's painting. And I think what it has always been doing is always been hitting its own ground running. That was then, this is now. We have vacated one place, and with that vacuum came the sense of, like, we are artists, and we are painters, and we have something to talk about within ourselves, with ourselves, with everyone included. Here is many people of many colors and creeds and economic backgrounds and genders. You know, my sister was one of only five women that were painting trains back in the day. There's 500 women now painting on walls and making incredible murals. The world of art takes a hiatus or a intermission. And that's when it sometimes finds itself lost in the, in the headlights. And this movement has come up from those ashes and put something that to this day for, for many reasons and, and in many places around the world is so current. And that's great, just like great art. Great art looks great when it was made and it looks great 50 years, 100 years later. And out of every empire, the only thing that survives out of every empire is the art. Thank you, Lee. I genuinely appreciate your time today. This was Thank absolutely you. enlightening, and it's been an honor to sit with you today. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.